Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'll uh, make a start a little bit early, but I am recording it. So um, the first couple of minutes are disclaimers anyway, so you're not going to be missing anything. But um, thank you and welcome to this non-farm payrolls, US payrolls webinar uh, on Friday, the 6th of September and the August payrolls report. I'm going to be covering a fair bit of ground today. This is obviously not just about the August payrolls report. There's an awful lot of event risk coming up in the in the next few days. We've also got a lot to talk about. I think the events this week, the rally in equity markets. But while I can, well, I sh I'd like to obviously um, cast your attention to the various disclaimers that are about to come up. Um, I'm not going to be giving any trade recommendations on this video even though i will be highlighting very key support and resistance levels with respect to um, a number of different markets nonetheless got quite a bit to get through expectations around this us payrolls report expectations around um, the next fed rate decision which is due um, just under two weeks from now uh, just uh, just a little over just a little under a week um, after next week's European Central Bank rate meeting, which is likely to be a market mover, not least because I think market expectations about what the ECB might do are probably slightly over-optimistic. There has been in the past few days some um, pushback from some governing council members about the possibility of further QE, which is likely to prompt, I think, some dissent as to how far the ECB is like to ease monetary policy next week, given concerns about um, the stability of the banking system and um, the ability of uh, European banks to make profit. But I'm slightly going off topic here because we're here to talk about non-farm payrolls. We're, talk we're here to talk about what the prospect of a decent number is likely to do to US rate cut expectations when the Fed meets later this month. So let's start first and foremost with what Fed rate cut expectations currently are. Now the screen that you've got in front of you right now is a Bloomberg rate screen. If any of you do have a Bloomberg the code is WIRP and what it does it gives you the implied probabilities of how much the Fed is likely to cut rates when it meets later this month. Now, currently at the moment, the Fed funds rate is this number here, between 2 and 2.25%. Now, we've heard an awful lot this week about the prospect that the Fed may decide to cut by 50 basis points. Now, certainly based on the manufacturing data, you'd have to say, yeah, there is, there's certainly a case for that. The only problem with that argument is that a manufacturing only makes up around about 11% of the US economy. What the what it what makes up the largest part of the US economy is services, and there we have also seen a little bit of a slowdown. But this week's ADP report was much better than expected, which came out yesterday with 195,000 new jobs being added. And while we have heard James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed talk about the possibility of a 50 basis point rate cut later this month, you also have to remember that there were two dissenters to the July rate cut in the form of Eric Rosengren of the Boston Fed and Esther George of the Kansas City Fed. So they were opposed to the 25 basis point rate cut that we saw in July. They've shown no indication thus far that they have shifted on that position. And while it's all well and good for Mr Bullard to talk about the possibility of a 50 basis point cut, he still needs a majority for that to happen. And Jerome Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, in his speech in Jackson Hole at the end of August, gave no indication whatsoever that he was minded to cut interest rates by more than 25 basis points. Certainly the implied probability here, this, this little box here, 18th of September, there's, the market is assigning an 88.7% probability that the Fed will cut rates by 25 basis points. The Fed funds rates from 1.75 to 2%.
they're only assigning an 11.3 probability of a 50 basis point cut. So for a 50 basis point cut to happen, you would need the data, you would need for the data to, to deteriorate quite substantially. And thus far, we haven't really seen much evidence of that. Yesterday's ISM services on our manufacturing report on the headline number was fairly decent. Um, new orders jumped quite sharply in August as did prices paid. The employment component was slightly weaker and obviously that is a concern but new orders jumped so you could find that the employment component in August could rebound this month in September. So it's very very difficult I think to sort of assign any particular indication as to whether or not the Fed is likely to go by 25 or 50. At the moment the smart money is on 25. So 25 basis points is the likely probable outcome of a Fed rate cut irrespective of how these numbers pan out. So there is another thing also that's giving me a little bit of concern because what we've seen thus far this week is a decent rebound in equity markets and there's been a number of reasons for that. Obviously one of the reasons is the fact that allegedly um, the US and China have decided to sit down and have a little chat in October despite the fact that we were told it was going to happen in September but you know let's just put semantics to one side. You can't lie about the price action. The price action has been uniformly positive and what we've seen thus far would appear to suggest the potential for further gains in equity markets. Now why do I say that? Well obviously we've seen some very decent gains over the course of the past few days. Obviously a lessening of tensions between US and China despite the fact that tariff levels are much higher now than they were a month ago. Also Italy's now managed to get itself a new government for how long? We don't know, but they've got a new government, so new elections aren't imminent. And in terms of the Hong Kong situation, we got a decent rebound this week on the back of the fact that Carrie Lam, the CEO, suggested that she was going to pull the extradition bill. Now, you know, the, the protesters have said, well, that's too little, too late. If you've done it in July, you know, now we're cooking. But unfortunately, I think too much bad blood has gone under the gone under the so-called bridge and it's going to be very very difficult I think going forward as to see whether or not we'll get a dialing back of tension but having said that there does appear to be some evidence of bending on the part of the Chinese and that in essence I think is why we've seen the rebound in the Hang Seng and Asia markets more broadly so a momentum is a powerful thing and what we've also seen over the past few days is a significant risk on trade coming on. There does appear to be evidence of a significant reversal in risk off. Now the risk off trades are gold higher, silver higher, bond yields lower, um, tr bu buying treasuries, buying bonds. We've seen a significant rebound in bond yields in the past two to three days and that's flashing up a warning sign. It's suggesting to me that market is priced in way too much easing relative to what's coming and they're having to readjust their expectations. So to give you a good example of this is what the US Treasury yield has done in the last couple of days. We've seen a very strong rebound in US two-year Treasuries. Now this is a daily candle chart. Okay, If we change that to a weekly candle chart um, that gives us a nice little rebound there. So that looks as if it's starting to form a little bit of a base. Not conclusive by any stretch of the imag imagination, but certainly some evidence that there might be, um, we might have seen the lows in the short term. If we then look at the German two-year yields, that becomes much more striking. If we look at, this is a daily chart, so it's not really telling us too much, but what we have seen is there are some very strong rebounds from those record lows of minus 0.8. 9.4. Okay, so my negative 0.94. Now, the current deposit rate for the ECB is minus 0.4. So essentially, the market's pricing in 50 basis points of cuts by the ECB over the course of the next two years. Is that likely, given concerns about the damage negative rates is doing to bank balance sheets? More importantly, what happens if we change that to a weekly chart? 
Now that to me looks like a bearish, sorry, a bullish reversal in terms of the weekly chart, which might suggest that yields have the potential to rebound. So if yields rebound, that generally tends to be positive for risk. That would then suggest that we might get a see, to see a rebound or further gains in equity markets. As I say, it's not by any means a done deal, but certainly the, the balance of probabilities are leading me to think that this bullish, potential bullish weekly reversal in the two year, which is also being matched in the prices, would appear to suggest that we could see a little bit of risk on. Now let's look at gold and silver. I got asked about gold and silver just before we came on air. And if we look at silver, again, we've seen a big correction in silver prices over the course of the past couple of days uh, on a daily chart, a very significant reversal. What happens when we change that to a weekly chart? Again, that is potentially um, a warning that we may have seen a short term top on the weekly chart. So change that back to the daily. Now let's look at gold prices very, very quickly before I start to go over the numbers um, with respect to pa Canadian and US payrolls. Now I've talked about this 1480 level on gold quite a lot. That's held as support. It was also 38.2% retracement of the entire down move from the all time highs in gold uh, to the lows of around about 1000. We've broken above it, but look what's happened over the course of the past couple of days. We've seen a big, big correction off those highs around about 1550. What does it look like on the weekly chart? OK, we can see that here. There's potentially a little bit of a reversal taking place. So we could see a little bit of a pullback in the risk off back to 1480 over the course of the next few days. Again, it really will depend on uh, on these payrolls numbers that we get later today. But certainly if we break below $1,500 an ounce, then we could see a little bit of a run to the downside. Let's quickly look at dollar CAD because dollar CAD, we've got the Canadian payrolls numbers. So if there's anything you want to get out right now, um, then it's probably a good idea to um, fire me a question over if I haven't covered it before the actual numbers come out. But certainly I think in terms of the direction of travel for equity markets, these payrolls numbers are unlikely, I think, to alter the dial too much with respect to the rebound that we've seen in equity markets, even if the FTSE at the moment is struggling below the 50 day moving average. Whether or not we see further gains in coming into the weekend is another matter because obviously we are a Friday. It's also been a short week for the US. Um, and I think as such, that could well limit the upside on any payrolls number. But certainly in terms of the risk trade and what we've seen so far this week, momentum does appear to be on equity market side. So even if we don't see new one month highs this week, we could see further gains next week. Judging from what we've seen in the S&P 500 thus far, we hit one month highs yesterday. We broke above 29.60, which was a very, very key level. And also the 50 day moving average here yesterday. That for me is a significant technical break. And as such does open up the prospect of another retest of 3000 on the S&P 500. But also if we look at the DAX, it's a similar sort of story. We've also broken above the 50 day moving average on the DAX and as such have the potential to move up to the 12,300 level. But again, I've got to caution you, we've seen some very good momentum thus far. And as such, we could see a little bit of profit taking as we head into the weekend. So expectations on the numbers. Let's first and foremost um, bring up the market calendar. So we can see the numbers in question as they come out and here they are. So we're looking for Canadian payrolls of full time employment to rise by 15,000. Now we saw big drops last month in Canadian payrolls, which was a little bit of a surprise. Unfortunately, Canadian jobs data tends to be what I would call a little bit volatile. So it's always difficult to extrapolate from one month to the next, but certainly in the context of the US payrolls numbers. If we get anything over and above 158,000, that's going to be generally positive. But even if it comes in 140, 130, I'm not overly concerned by the headline number on the non-farm payrolls number. Certainly we'll be keeping an interest in look on the private payrolls number. More importantly, it's the wages number. Prices paid, um, we have started to see some inflation start to trickle through in some of the underlying inflationary numbers, inflation numbers 
on some of the ISM readings, which would suggest that even with a higher dollar, these tariffs are starting to put upward pressure on prices within the US economy. Now, at the moment, that's not constraining consumer spending. Uh, that still remains fairly strong. That was 0.6% at the last term, um, at the last count. And we've got US retail sales next week on the back of a consumer confidence number in August, which was fairly positive. It was only slightly lower than the July number, despite the fact that President Trump at the beginning of August stated that he was going to put term 15% tariffs on the remaining $300 billion of Chinese goods. Now, he has deferred some of them to the 15th of December, but nonetheless, he did that about two or three weeks after the fact that he announced them. So there could have been some spillover effect there. But overall, I don't, I don't expect you know these numbers to be particularly dollar negative or dollar positive. But what I would say is that a strong wages number could put upward pressure on the dollar, push the euro dollar back below 110. Let's have a quick look at euro dollar just before we get to the numbers because that for me I think is very very key. We have seen a little bit of a short squeeze here and we've seen a very long shallow candle there which would suggest that we might see a dip uh, in euro dollar back to around 109.80 but for me the market feels a little bit short on euro dollar and as a result we could squeeze back up ahead of next week's ECB back to 110.80 and 111 given the fact that you could argue that that is a potential hammer on the euro dollar. If we look at cable here, again, we've seen a similar sort of snapback in cable uh, on, on the cable chart uh, to, to around about 123. But again, for me, the big, big resistance level on cable is this level here, 123.80. Um, We've seen some very decent gains over the course of the past two or three days after making a significantly new low. So let me just close that down and actually bring this back up again so that um, we can change that to the weekly chart very, very quickly to get an idea of potentially what we might be looking at. And the numbers are coming out now. They're breaking. And we've got 3.2 average hourly earnings. Um, payroll's 130. So that's disappointing. I, I, very decent number on the Canada payrolls. Um, so that's probably going to push dollar CAD down quite sharply. Unemployment rate 3.7%. Um, the revision. So headline number a little bit disappointing, 130. Uh, private payrolls, 96. So a little bit of a slowdown in the overall headline number. But fairly decent wage growth number and interestingly enough 3.3 percent revision to the previous month on earnings as well so actually wage growth is much firmer even if the headline is a little bit weaker so that might suggest to me that the, the labor market is a little bit tight um, and could put and does appear to be actually putting upward pressure not only on wages but also on prices certainly I think the market doesn't really know what to, to make of that it's a little bit negative in terms of the headline but a little bit positive in terms of the earnings so let's quickly look at dollar yen because I think dollar yen more than anything will give you a good indication of what this number is going to do dollar wise and in terms of dollar wise I think it's going to be very very difficult to really break significantly above the 50-day moving average on this one here. 50-day moving average is currently acting as resistance around about 107.25.30 and I think as such it's going to be very very I think with dollar yen it's very much a case of sell the rally until such times as we break the 50-day moving average and it's probably going to trade 106.107.25. There does seem to be a little bit of a barrier at 107.20, 107.25 which is obviously the highs that we saw yesterday um, does that does that well, does anyone have any questions on anything thus far um, I've tried to cover gold I've tried to cover silver um, had a quick look at the S&P 500 not really seeing anything significantly exciting with respect to that apart from the fact that we're probably likely to see um, a buy the dip mentality on equity markets obviously in the absence of any President Trump Twitter activity, which does have the um, disadvantage of knocking markets down like it did in 
in early August um, after he came out and rented, or oh sorry, the end of August when he came out and rented uh, about the Fed and what have you. Um, but um, looking at gold, we've seen a nice little rebound on the back of those numbers. I'm not really sure why, because actually in terms of the dollar, in, fact, in terms of the dollar effect, it's fairly neutral. If we look at the implied probability of Fed funds, what we've seen here is pretty much no move at all in the implied probability of a move on US rates. And in terms of the two year yield on the US Treasury, very little move in terms of the bond market either. So a pretty pretty uninspiring set of numbers from the US. If we look at the dollar CAD though, I think we could well see a very decent reaction on that. But what I would say about this dollar CAD move lower is that we are now approaching a very key support area. I inked it in there and we can see it here. So if we look at these these levels here so the 50 day moving average the low from the 13th of august and the low from the 6th of august and the low from the 5th of august there's some really decent support all the way through this level here on dollar cat so decent canadian jobs report makes it very unlikely that um, the Bank of Canada will be cutting rates anytime soon, um, which suggests that there's a decent possibility that this 70-80 level on the CAD may well hold in the short term, but could well trickle down towards the lows that we saw at the, be at the end of at, at the beginning at the beginning of July, beginning of August, around about 131. So I'll keep an eye on that 131-75-80 level on dollar CAD because if we break below that we could see a few stops triggered below the 70. Um, looking, just being asked a question here, why the dip in the FTSE 100? Um, let's just have a look, quick look at that. Let's look at five minutes and let's see if we saw it on all the others. Let's look at the S&P as well. Because usually there's a correlation. If you get a dip in one, you'll probably get a dip in the other. And yet, yeah, basically, all of them, all of them dipped a little on the back of um, on the back of the headline number, but they've come back a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, if we look at this FTSE chart here and look at the range over the course of the last four hours, we're trading 76.56, so we're trading in a 20-point range, which is really, really tight. So. Um, sometimes you'll get these little dips here and there but at the moment we haven't really broken out of the range that we've been in since early this morning decent support around about 50 55 decent resistance about 75 80 I don't really expect that to change and would expect the market to probably drift back down over the course of the next over the next few hours particularly if cable continues to push higher um, there tends to be at the moment a little bit of a, a negative FTSE effect um, if cable um, starts to head higher at the moment it's around about 123.10 if we head back up towards 123.5 123.60 you could see the FTSE start to find upside a little bit limited but if cable then drops back below 123 you'll probably see it go back again now the reason for that is that there's an awful lot of dollar earners in the FTSE 100 which is why when the DAX rallied yesterday for whatever reason you didn't get um, a similar rebound in the FTSE 100 because cable was rallying very very strongly from the lows that we saw earlier this week. Um, so I'm hoping that helps to a certain extent but, but generally there is always an awful lot of volatility around numbers. Um, markets look for the weak side, try and find out where the buy and sell orders are and as such that could just be the market trying to test out 
trying to test out where the weakest points are with respect to the buy orders and the sell orders. And the fact that we've seen it in both the FTSE and the S&P suggests that's the market just trying to find out where the weakest side is. So there may be no reason for it whatsoever. It's just the market trying to test out the boundaries of where the weakest positions are to try and flush them out. That happens an awful lot in the wake of any any macroeconomic data announcement the market tries to find the weakest level um, right next one euro yen and dollar yen okay let me just work my way through these gents because I've got quite a few so if I haven't got to you yet please bear with me I will get to you right okay euro yen Now we're talking about risk on and risk off. Basically, when equities do well, the yen tends to weaken. And when equities do badly, the yen tends to strengthen. Now, in the past couple of days, we've seen a fairly decent rebound in euro yen. Now, if we look at the weekly candle on this, we do have the potential for a little bit of a rebound in euro yen now that can happen in one of two ways we can get a strong rebound in euro dollar or a strong rebound in dollar yen uh, certainly given the, the extent of the rebound that we've seen in the past couple of days there is scope for a bit of a short squeeze in euro yen so if you're short of it maybe you need to think twice about that because i think if equity markets continue to push higher over the course of the next week or so which i suspect they will um, could be wrong then euro yen will probably follow it higher as well and let's not forget the ecb rate decision will prompt a little bit of position adjustment ahead of that decision which is due of thursday next week certainly in the context of this move here <coughs> that's a fairly decent bullish reversal which would appear to suggest that in the event of any dips back down here you may find some ready buyers to push us back into the resistance level up here also the fact that the chinese are looking to ease monetary policy in september october and november that's likely to add to the positive positive risk sentiment that we've had coming out over the course of the last few days monetary easing is always generally tends to be good for risky assets and chinese rates are much higher uh, than your other central bank averages it's pretty much the same in aussie yen um, if we look at aussie yen Certainly the candlesticks here are telling me that the market's a little bit short. We've seen a little bit of a breakout here. And again, um, there is certainly potential for Aussie Yen to go back to around about 75. So weaker Yen generally equates to higher equity markets. So as long as the Yen continues to weaken, any downside in equity markets is likely to be fairly, um, fairly difficult. It's fa fairly well supported. Um, where do I see the resistance in the German DAX? 12,300 is the short answer to that question. Um, and that's that basically, that's that level there. If I can just point it out. I had a look at that earlier. We've broken the 50 day. Um, there is a very, there's a candle here around uh, on the 25th of July. Um, the lows on that day, around about 12,300. I think if, if the DAX continues to move higher, while it's above the 50 day moving average then there's potential for us to go to 12,300 so hopefully that answers your question and to feed in to the risk trade we have to include the chinese renminbi or the offshore chinese renminbi um because i've just been asked that oh yeah i've just been asked that um that is also looking to roll over and it has room to roll over it has room to roll down all the way to seven at the moment, this was the previous peak. This was the level that the Chinese were defending, 698.7. We've broken above it. We've come back. We've retested it. We haven't broken below it. Now, we're t currently testing the 710 level. We may find a little bit of support there. But if equity markets continue to rally, then the risk-off trades um, generally, or, or the risky trades generally tend to come back down. So if equity markets continue to go up gold will continue to come off silver will come off the yen will weaken and the renminbi 
will strengthen it will head back to this seven level here um, I still think the renminbi is going to go to 72730 over the course of the next quarter but that's not to say that we can't get it come back down here look to buy it at around these levels and then look for it to move higher it's all about the timing of when you buy um, because the last thing you want to be doing is buying at the top of a rally or selling at the bottom of a, a trough. That's just not the thing you want to do. Timing is everything. So um, we still have a whole host of tariff increases set to come in over the course of the next few um, weeks and months. And I think once it starts to become apparent that they will st start to impact consumer spending, um, then I think it's quite likely that gold will start to head higher. But I think at the moment there's an awful lot of trades out there that people are thinking are one-way bets, and there is no such thing. It's ebb and flow, ebb and flow, ebb and flow. And the risk, I think, for me at the moment is that we retest some, very, some key support levels. So we could come all the way back here. It wouldn't alter this seven level. It wouldn't alter my overall view that the Chinese renminbi will continue to weaken, but it could take some time to get back to 7.20 and 7.30 and go to 7.30. But the trend is definitely up. You can see that we're going here, sideways, up, back, up, back, and then potentially higher. So it's all about the levels, technical analysis and charting. Getting at the right level and you sleep easier at night. Getting at the wrong level and you have to be reaching for the sleeping pills. So at the moment, the dollar's looking a little bit weaker. Um, you've got the DAX continuing to push up. FTSE's looking fairly well supported near its recent highs. To be quite honest, you know, I think that's the way of it at the moment. We will see equity markets continue to be buy on dips until such times as President Trump opens his mouth or um, something unexpected happens to temper expectations when we head into next week um, WTI very very quickly just just notice someone ask about that that's still very much in a downtrend we can see that here um, if we just look at this daily chart so at the moment while we're below this trend line that I've drawn from the highs in April very much sell the rally if we look at the long wick on these candles here we can see there's plenty of selling interest anywhere near 57 and a half dollars between 57 and a half and 58 dollars a barrel um, also important to look at Brent crude in the round when you're looking at oil prices because they do correlate quite nicely so if we look at Brent crude it's going to tell you a fairly similar story um, so I think as long as Brent crude prices stay below this downtrend line here, then WTI are fairly, um, it's going to be fairly difficult for WTI prices to rally. And again, you see you've got a very long upper shadow on this candle, which suggests there's plenty of selling interest above the 50 day moving average on Brent crude. So at the moment, I'm of the opinion Brent crude sell the rally, which is likely to be fairly positive for consumers because they'll have more money in their pocket because they won't have to fill up at the pumps. It'll, it won't cost them anywhere near as much um, and that's likely to keep services uh, services sector fairly resilient because one of the things we I have noticed and I'm sure you got you guys have as well while manufacturing has been weak services still remains fairly strong here in the UK it makes up 70 80 percent of the economy in the US 70 80 percent of the UK economy so even if the economy flatlines or is just slightly expansionary with wage growth fairly decent and we've got UK wages next week um, I think the economy can do okay um, as long as services remains robust unemployment remains low and wages remain at their current levels um, have I missed anything off ladies and gents is there anything else that anyone would like to talk to me about or ask me about with respect to particular markets because if not, um, just like to remind you that of some key events coming up, key market events. Obviously, we've talked about the European Central Bank 
on Thursday. So the big question is, what rates are they? What 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 rates are they going to cut? Are they going to cut all three or just one? What sort of lending program will they announce? We've got China Trade for August. We've got UK wages and unemployment data out on the 10th. Got US retail sales on the 13th. Obviously, we've got Brexit. Less said about that, the better. Um, we've also got Apple. Now, Apple, that should be interesting because um, we've got the iPhone 11 launch on the 11th of September. And um, I've, been, I've been looking at at Apple's, uh, I've been looking at Apple's share price, and it is quite near record highs. You know, these are the record highs here, but it's struggling to get back above 215. Now, this iPhone launch, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of iPhones. I've got to say, especially these new ones. I think spending over a thousand pound for an iPhone is a little bit excessive, especially when they bring out a new model every year. And the big thing about this iPhone is it doesn't have 5G. And when you've got Samsung bringing out a folio with a folding screen for around about one and a half thousand pounds, and it does have 5G, why would you pay over a grand for a phone that doesn't have 5G? They, they're bringing that out next year. So I'm not overly convinced that the launch on the 11th is really going to float anyone's boat. But hey-ho, we remain to be seen. But certainly I think that could introduce a little bit of volatility in the Apple share price over the course of the next few days. So... Um, with respect to gold, do, do I think gold will continue to rally this year? Yeah, I've, I've answered that question. I think we will find that we could slip back. As long as we hold above 1480, then I can still see gold heading to 1575, 1580. But at the moment, we could see a little bit of short-term weakness. But overall, I expect gold to head back to the highs over the course of the rest of the year um, and test this level here which is i just draw my weekly chart in 1587 is the next target for me on gold and that is the 61.8 fibonacci retracement level of the entire down move from the record highs in 2011 to the lows that we saw back in 2015. So overall, that is my target for gold um, by year end. How we get there is anybody's guess, but we need to hold above 1480 for that to, um, to play out. So hopefully that answers your question on gold. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much. Hope you all have a great weekend. Um, and... Um, I'd like to say thank you for attending and I'll see you all in the same time, same place a month from now for uh, the September payrolls report. In the meantime, thanks very much for tuning in and have a wonderful weekend.